Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. My guest today is Dr. Michael Collo, who some of you may know from the Curious Quant podcast series that uh, we developed late last year in 2019. So I've introduced Mike back to sort of get an update on on what he's been up to and, and his journey to date. Michael, welcome. Oh, hi, Alex. How are you? Very well. So, you know, for the listeners at home, some of them have listened in to your Curious Quant podcast um, and sort of wondering what you're up to. Can you give us a bit of a backdrop most definitely. So as you said, Alex, um, we started this Curious Quant podcast last year, and the intention was very much to bring some of the voices of uh, kind of statistical, quantitative AI thought leadership, I suppose, as it pertains to financial services and investing um, for a more general audience in a very kind of conversational manner. Um, that I think was a, a pretty good run. Uh, we had some fantastic guests on um, and I can occasionally still have uh, guests on to discuss various different topics. I, th- I think for me, I mean, my, my journey, this was possibly in, in one chapter of my journey, but my overall journey for, I guess, for those that um, were not part of those podcasts is uh, I did my PhD in London. I ended up having a career in asset management in London, uh, working for some of the biggest names, um, I suppose, in quantitative investing from risk to, to factor investing to a bunch of other things as well. I ran my own fund. For a while, and and I think over time I became kind of convinced that AI and automation and technology were, were kind of here to stay, and not only that, but they were going to fundamentally change so many different aspects of our lives, uh, and finance being one of those stories. But there's so many other parts of that story as well, and so I became a kind of speaker for that subject, ended up writing a bunch on the topic, and became very interested in it, very passionate advocate for things like AI and ethics. Uh, for fairness uh, and understanding how algorithms think about the world differently to, differently to human beings, but also a little bit of anxiety around automation and the future of work and the kinds of things that that could happen and ensuring that, you know, that was done in a good way or a kind of a societally aware kind of way. Um, and I think we met Alex when I, we moved to Australia about three years ago and I kind of continued my work at the time for an investment management company. I was working with AXA for uh, probably about a year here and ended up joining a, a large ASA owner called HESTA, which is a fantastic experience for about a year to set up their quantitative capabilities and, and hire the team and, and get that going. But I think for me personally, I became very much um, enamored by the notion that AI was a kind of once in a generational impact and it was happening all around us, perhaps more internationally than in Australia. And so I really wanted to be part of that conversation. I really wanted to touch the people that were part of that conversation, touch those conversations to, to really kind of interact uh, with with that whole topic area, so therefore the podcast that we created was one element of that. Uh, but for me, it, it's been about understanding, you know, that that space. And I think more recently, for me, it was about joining a company called Fathom. AI, who very much thinks about automation and the future of work in in a kind of very quantitative way, and, and is able to kind of think about it also from a societal lens as well, from a kind of a uh, sort of an awareness of, of, of its greater impact kind of way. So for me, it's, it's a new journey. I, I suppose I've kind of pivoted a little bit from that more standard asset management, financial services career um, uh, away to this particular topic area and therefore into you know technology, software, SaaS type conversations and, and perhaps some regulatory conversations as well as along the way. Um, so it's an interesting journey for me. And I suppose as part of that journey, now you find me on the other side of, a, well, the Australia's purposes, the other side of a pandemic for the global purpose is still very much in the middle of a pandemic. Um, thinking a lot more about, you know, how does this COVID pandemic is going to impact things like automation and uh, the use of technology as, as we kind of look to, to the next phase. So before we maybe d- dig into the whole you know, transformation of, of work in this post-pandemic or still current pandemic environment, you know, let's go back to to your roles at, at AXA and, and also at HESTA. You know, what has been the journey as sort of systematic trading, algorithmic trading, factor investing has become a bigger and bigger part of their investment decision making? What have you seen that's been the biggest transformation for, for asset owners in terms of this quantitative finance? 
So I think um, it's, I mean, everything moves ebbs in ebbs and flows. I think many of your listeners will, who have been uh, through different cycles will tell you that for a while, quantitative and systematic solutions were very popular and then they went out of favor and then they go back in favor. So there's an element of this, which is ebbs and flows. And, you know, I think post 2008, we learned um, the, the very hard way, humility. So when I was starting my career uh, at BlackRock, and in 2008, we were using many of the quantitative models to measure risk. And I think BlackRock was kind of, I would confidently say, ahead of the rest in, in many of its uh, measurements and, and quantitative um, sort of uh, tools, I suppose. But still, there was a sense by which um, that whole process brought a lot of these models to question. And it obviously humbled us intellectually, and as a whole industry and then the quantitative community as well. And I think the reason I kind of mentioned that is because that's really kind of one of those elements where you ebb and flow and you go up and down. I think there's other elements where um, there's only been a rise in technology and the way that technology has been used to scale and to create efficiencies in asset management. And primarily, you've seen that in operational backend side. So you've kind of seen how operational uh, functions of asset owners, asset managers have become just incredibly technical and incredibly detailed and, and technology dependent. The front office, I would say, in terms of forecasting markets and forecasting of outcomes, still have not moved away from a lot of narratives. So I, I would almost say slightly, you know, uh, I suppose disappointed in the idea that relative to the amount of data that we have, the amount of sophistication we have in modeling, the, the amount of intellectual capital we have to draw on, I would argue that if you looked at, um, you know, financial news and Bloomberg or CNBC, anybody else talking about markets and earnings, you would not really be able to differentiate the kind of discourse that was happening 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so in so some ways, I think we've not been able to divorce ourselves from these narratives. Um, is, is that partially because so some people think that some of these quantitative tools are effectively black boxes? Um, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. So uh, black box is a relative term. So what is black box to you may not be a black box to me. So I think what they kind of, when someone says to you, it's a black box, it usually means that they don't fully understand the way that information is being used by that model, the limitations, the strengths and weaknesses of that model, what it can tell us about the world and what it can't tell us about the world. And, and I do worry that, um, the difference in knowledge capability required, for example, for uh, fund selectors who are required to do due diligence on a factor strategy or a AI strategy or a more serious quantitative strategy is quite big. And, and it's only getting bigger because data and methodologies and statistics are increasing. So the science of data analysis is increasing. So the gap is getting wider. And the gap is kind of being filled by intermediaries, so people that kind of tell stories or, or are able to kind of rely on intuition to tell non-technical people why, what a technical process is trying to do. And in, and in doing those stories and those gaps, they obviously can uh, accidentally or perhaps nefariously implant false expectations about what these techniques and data actually give you. So the idea of a black box is I suppose, replaced by a gray or, or a semi-transparent box where you have stories to tell you what this highly technical thing might be doing under different circumstances. Uh, but you have to be very aware of the limitations as well. You have to be very aware of what it cannot tell you or what it doesn't tell you about the future of the world. And I, and I get the sense that, that that space between for the stories is ever increasing because we're using more and more data to try to fill it. So I, think, I don't think it's as simple as a black box, white box. I, I do think that it's, it's a, um, there's a fundamental divide between, let's say, uh, a population of people who argue by induction in financial services, so people who kind of say, look, here's an example or a case that I think is true, and therefore it, this is always generally true, or this is true for these other companies or these other circumstances as well, versus those people who are happy to argue by deduction to say, look, we can quantitatively measure these as 200 instances of this thing, Therefore, in this particular example, I can learn from those 200 instances and apply it here. Um, and if you ever read Super Forecaster, you get a sense that the people that uh, rely upon the latter way of thinking often are, are much harder to get sound bites out of. It's much harder to put them in front of a TV camera because they appear highly uncertain. They're telling you about how uncertain the world is. They're telling you that they have marginally better information than flipping a coin. 
and that's not really attractive to hear. So uh, I think as an industry, we, we are laden with these behavioral biases where if you ask an average asset owner, what do you think is the probability of beating the market for an excellent manager or for the manager you've chosen as an example, um, they might give you a very, very different number than what, what will be statistically borne out by the data. It's interesting your, your your conversation there around sort of how to deduct information. You know, do you, do you think in terms of asset owners that they need this blend between sort of the engineers, the maths, you know, the mathematicians that can help build these models quantitatively, and at the same time needing maybe the historians and sociologists that can help understand the stories so that they can sort of bridge that gap. So it's a fascinating one because a lot of storytelling is about it's about winning trust, and it's about winning trust from people that will be your clients or people that you want to kind of invest in your strategy. Asset owners don't have this problem; um, they don't need to explain their investment process or strategy. At least most of them don't to their uh, members because the members are either I don't care or kind of not not that it's not that way built an in industry. So in some sense, they don't have those narratives that are required really to the externally facing. They might need it internally to convince themselves it's true. On the other hand, I think narratives can be used as a way to um, create some humility around what data or a data-based system can tell you. Um, and I think that that humility is very valuable. Hopefully it comes from the data scientists themselves. I actually am a little bit, I suppose, biased in this perception. I think that data, um, so not data owners, but rather asset owners should almost be primarily um, arbitrators of, of data and information that is coming at them from all these different places, from asset managers, from quantitative or fundamental, from factors, whoever, then have a fairly standard way of describing the signals or the ideas that are coming into their company, uh, the risks associated with them, uh, the kind of belief systems that they entail and so on. And that standard language should really be the gatekeeper for what is regarded as talent, human talent or machine talent, any kind of talent you want coming into the asset management space. I find that that common language, which used to be the factor language, for example, for risk factors and factor-based languages, is really not present very often. I think a lot of asset owners, not just Australia, but globally, have their own system, their own language. Sometimes it's factor-based, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's factor-based with exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. So it feels like it's a, it's a really, it's a sifting kind of role that they have to do. And, and mathematics is the only common language across all these different dialogues. So if anything, I guess I, I would wait more into the, they need to have a lot more uh, of that type of systematic thinking when they're evaluating the world. You know, if, if we go into the systematic th thinking sort of framework, you know, how much is there a potential to over-optimize in this sort of systematic approach? You know, where you feel that you've got this model, you can just plug things in and try and optimize for an outcome. You know, is, is that a likely, you know, explanation of, of things that can go wrong? Oh, 100%. 100%. So um, Campbell Harvey made, made some great points recently. We actually had him on the podcast as well. But um, he's been a great champion for showcasing that financial literature and academia has, has heavily guilty uh, with this type of um, sort of a fi uh, bias where papers are, are have to find uh, variables, have to find significant variables to be able to generate alpha and returns. And so, you know, out of all the factors that have ever been found, a very small proportion of them are actually able to be continued and, and to be done. And so there, there's a kind of a heavy push from academia, therefore from the kind of quantitative framework to try to squeeze out an optimal strategy based on some kind of a backtest data, some kind of sample data as, as a kind of training data set. And so the problems of being biased in that, in that um, can be addressed partially statistical uh, characteristics. But ultimately, the problem is, and I don't think machine learning is going to make this any easier, unfortunately, is that if you have the ability to test 5,000 different ways of investing, 5,000 different models, by definition, you'll find a small fraction of them that are always statistically significant. You'll find 50 that are great and five that are exceptional. And those five will just look incredibly powerful to you. And whether you then believe them anymore or not is really a question of whether you think the system is stable or not in terms of how it generates returns. But the idea of overfitting in backtests, by the way, is again highlighted more recently during the pandemic, where we've got a lot more access to data for now casting 
So when we're looking at, for example, things like historical um, interest rates or better yet inflation, and, and we see a huge spike in inflation from, you know, nothing, 3% to 25% or 20%. And, um, you know, that really messes up models that massively messes up back tests that massively messes up all these configuration problems. And in fact, I'm guessing, that unfortunately, anybody using that data for the next 10, 20 years, all the students coming through universities and people trying to create models are going to be like trying to deal with what do I do with this incredible spike in all these different metrics? How do I incorporate into them my model? How do I optimize it around it, et cetera? When in this case, it's not a, a product of a financial outcome or econo economic outcome necessarily. It's a product of a, of, a, of a political intervention. So I think it's a, um, it's a fascinating problem to have. Now, we can't dispense with data because we need it to test the hypothesis. So even Soros would tell you that, that investing is a series of hypothesis testing processes. Um, so you need data, but you need to be clever in the way they use it. And you need to be very... Um, dynamic, I suppose, in the relationships that you identify. And so able to do that and doing it effectively does mean you need to have more skill in, in data manipulation and you need to have more wisdom around it as well. It, it, you, you raised two really interesting points. One is around sort of the data and, and these massive sort of uh, tail, tail scenarios. And I know when, when, you're, when you're back at university, sometimes they tell you, look, you just got to truncate some of these pieces, otherwise the model doesn't work. Um, so that's that's one excuse that that's used to try and deal with these things. But then the other piece, which you sort of touched on, which is, you know, when you start going factor hunting, and you know, now in this current environment, the power of processing is just so so available. There's so much data. You start to end up with this situation where everyone ends up flooding down the same path, and you end up with such such crowding in the system. And you know, financial markets aren't stable, um, and the data generating process you know, it's, it's very hard to also say that that's stable. So you've got this, this real issue where you, you almost create a type of fragility in the market. Is that is that a fair a statement? Well, it, it's an interesting point because I think there's there's kind of almost two narratives here, right? One of the narratives says that the um, availability of financial data, the, um, I suppose, publicization of factor investing uh, and the pricing at which these products are sold into the market, i.e. very low pricing, so therefore requires a lot of scale, um, basically lead us to a point where they're more or less homogeneous and they're kind of available for everybody to invest with. And so on the one hand, there's a narrative that says, okay, great, so we should go and do that because there are price risk factors that we're going to get compensated in the long run for it. There's another narrative that says, actually, there's no alpha because everyone's got the same information. But the idea of what happens when you've got crowding in factors has been something that's been studied for a long time. And I think the empirical uh, evidence for this stuff seems to indicate that most of the time crowding in factors happens when there's a risk event, either risk off or risk on event. And many uh, uh, other agents other than quantitative investors are flocking into one area of that, of that trade. So either they're all getting out of the market and all buying utilities and telcos and defensively sitting on consumer staples, or this thing on the other side as an example. So the, these kind of factor crowding strategies, there's one example of it called a quant meltdown, which um, is quite funny to call it that. In 2007, there was a series of very targeted liquidations by what we think might have been Goldman's, but we don't really know, um, which basically left a lot of these typical quantitative strategies really, really dented. Um, but by really dented, most of them lost 3 4% intramonth, which for them was a really, really big deal. But economically, I, I would argue it wasn't, wasn't necessarily a killer uh, for a typical long-only fund, especially because they made it uh, back a lot. So I, I think there's one argument that says availability of data plus availability of information uh, plus the marketing engines behind these type of products means that everybody knows about them. Therefore, everybody could be buying the same factors. So there could be an option for that. There's another option that says, okay, there's another narrative that says actually what we now have is incredibly non-linear methodologies like machine learning um, and neural networks and all the other kinds of subcategories underneath. And that allows us to create a, an enormous arrangement of different kinds of models underneath that. So if you and I ran machine learning on the same data, chances are because of the huge amount of hyperparameters and configurations and dials and knobs that we have to configure, we will not end up at the same result. So therefore, we'll not end up at the same portfolio. So, so typically, machine learning um, uh, in, its, in its ideal phase, I suppose, does not lead to crowding, does not encourage that type of behavior. What does, however, is the this idea that you have 
everybody has the same backtesting data. Everybody uses the same methodology. Everybody uses the same risk model, whether it's a factor model or VAR model or whatever. So therefore, we all react the same way to when a particular risk episode happens, as an example. We all liquidate. We all do, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, there were some really interesting instances, which I'll need to read up on a bit more at, at the beginning of the pandemic, where you had um, market stoppages all over the place, right? So you had market stoppages in the US and in, I think in like say some other markets as well. And it was a fascinating time because it, yeah, there was a real sense by which the market couldn't equilibrate. It could not find a, a good price point. It needed to be stopped. Are you talking about the limit down when it was limit down 5% or even limit up 5% on a couple of days? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, it, 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 these are moments where I, I start to think are either – the information is so enormously different day to day, which it could be because of OPEC was was um, kicking off at the time as well, I recall. Or it's just the fact that there's so much of that one-way traffic in orders that we're unable to find that you can't find the price that is within a reasonable bound. But if you give it a few more days, you will find the price that is within reasonable bound. Yeah, one. I guess one of the things that that always comes up in this in this uh, type of environment, this risk off environment is this sort of selling begets scaling, you know, and selling just keeps following on because the models keep rebalancing. A lot of the asset owners have got their models and their risk models that they need to to play in. So you end up with this really significant reversal that, that can come through. You know, how, how can quantitative finance maybe help to address these sort of these sort of issues in terms of trying to maybe have a different thinking around sort of the rules and tools that are used when you get into these sort of crisis environments? Well, it's, it's a great question. I think, I think it's also a great question specifically for asset owners to consider because one of the interesting things that arose during this pandemic crisis is the role of asset owners as custodians of long-term capital and therefore an opportunity to buy into obvious market weakness point. So you had this kind of case where there was a very aggressive sell-off and with some certainty, we knew that um, it would have a, let's say, at most a medium term horizon impact. Um, so therefore, if you're kind of a long term investor, this was an excellent opportunity for you to step into the market and provide that. But for reasons of liquidity or reasons of risk aversion, I would suggest, although I don't have the data to back it up, that we did not see extensive buying from many asset owners around the world during this period of time. So we did not see them display those type of long-term um, contrarian type of uh, behaviors that we would expect them to do at this time. So I, I think for me, the quantitative investing here carries with it many things, but one of them it carries is this discipline to say, this is my investment process. I've written it down either in a code or in data, or I've written it down in words. And I've written it down because I want it to mean something. I want it to be you know, um, credible. And the only way that I can credibly justify, I suppose, my value add during, uh, you know, for long-term investing is by, let's say, being a buyer of distressed asset with that, that long-term perspective. Um, so for me, it's not so much necessarily quantitative investing. I mean, you can you can have a model, a risk model, otherwise that will tell you whatever you wanted to tell you during this period. It can tell you that you should be buying at the low. It can tell you that you know you should be risk averse and getting out of risky assets, etc. But ultimately, I think if you have a investment process that is quite systematic, then you set yourself certain targets and rules. You should have seen opportunities for you to go into the market and buy and buy fairly aggressively for you to be able to make up that type of value add that you would suggest you have for your um, for your clients over like a five or 10 year horizon. Mm -hmm. Let's um, add in the flavor of alternate data, right? A, a number of uh, asset owners have sort of profess that they're, they're moving into that space and looking for different data sets to try and help their decision making. You know, what, what have you seen that's, that's sort of transformed in, in that space? So I think alt data is, is amazing. And I think in some sense, we kind of do a disservice to it by calling it alternative data. I think, I think ultimately it's, it's not alternative anymore. I think it's just the new frontier or, or necessary data or call it whatever you like. Um, I think what I've seen in alternative data is uh, primarily an acceptance that you know many strategies have to innovate and bring in different kinds of data to tell you about the world. Some of these alternative data sources have been broad enough to be able to apply to a cross-section of equity returns or a cross-section of multi-asset returns, such as news-based analytics. And news-based analytics probably has one of the biggest impacts there, natural language processing models that talk about how to quantify 
sentiment, how to quantify topic analysis, get brought into things like uh, risk management, get brought into things like strategic risk, get brought into things like um, off-balance sheet risk, so legal risks and various other elements like that, <coughs> maybe even geopolitical risk, which is a, um, is a really interesting one and really hard to quantify, except for the use of NLP and, and other sentiment analysis. So I think alternative data has had really good inroads in that way. And I think you'll find that many of the major data providers today provide some set of solutions around natural language processing or kind of new sentiment um, kind of analytics uh, and the academia as well provides some grounding for it. It's not an alpha source. It's very hard to use it unconditionally as an alpha source. It's a conditioning agent. It's something that you bring into a particular topic and therefore it's probably quite useful for fundamental or quantum mental investing as well. Um, I think the other elements that people have talked a lot about, but perhaps haven't really provided the same kicker has been around satellite imagery. So satellite imagery or kind of, um, I suppose, monitoring technologies tell you about the movement of things, so cars, ships, airplanes, and so on. And if you're able to relate them to some kind of specific asset class or asset behavior, then you can make money off the back of it. And, and I'm sure that there are kind of asset specific strategies to do that, but it's very hard to do it in a um, kind of a global multi-asset kind of approach. I think, I think it, the successes are more found in uh, commodity trading and, and especially when the commodities are a bit more specialized and focused on a particular geopolitical events and so on. So for example, knowing that there are, I don't know, military troop movements near a very specific um, you know, oil refinery or a particular scenario situation can give you a sense that there might be higher probability of, of uh, you know, supply constraints and therefore, et cetera, et cetera. So I think those kinds of alternative data have been there. And some of that has also been pulled into things like now casting, which is really about learning about real-time economic activity. So learning about credit cards, spends, and things like that. Some of those are pretty good, um, but they tend to be a little bit short-term in horizon. So you can kind of get a Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index like a week or something like that earlier because you're using something else to do it. I think where there's unusually large movements, I think that's a, a really good thing to do. Um, I, I tend to find that one of the most imaginative areas I've seen more recently, especially is supply chain. Supply chain has come a long way. We've had it for a while as part of data sets, but it's a very complex piece of data set to work with. It's hard to understand, um, I suppose, uh, the economic impacts of 45 different components into a widget and why, which one of those components comes from where and why it matters and so on. I think as we go through COVID and as we go through the geopolitical effects that we'll have globally, so we'll probably see less globalization in various different categories. We'll certainly see less movement of human capital, um, at least for a while. And we might see some other geopolitical effects that come out of it. It's an interesting question to ask how fragile some of these supply chains are to, to companies, to businesses, to even governments, um, and how to kind of take it forward. Um, I, I'm personally very excited about one category of data set, which is, I think, still very much at the early stages which is really about the quantification of human resources. So we, we talk a lot about technology and machines and AI, but we also talk a lot about the importance of skill and the importance of experience, the importance of essentially human-centric skill sets, human-centric value. And uh, I, you know, HR departments have been talking long about you know, culture and various other things like that, but it's, it, it retains very hard to quantify. And I think we're getting closer now to tracking and understanding the movement of human skill not only in startups and, and valuing, you know, whatever ratios of which startup we should invest in, but also across the middle and the, even the bottom of an organization. So rather than just knowing something about the CEO of a large multinational, we'll increasingly know a lot more about the um, structure of the HR underneath the CEO, this kinds of skills, the abilities, the tenure, the demography, the, the diversity of those people uh, underneath them and how they potentially work with technology, automation, other kinds of factors to create value for shareholders. And I think that that to me would be a, a brilliant way to get a lot more insight into what we currently have is a very traditional window into the corporate company, which is through its financials. So is this sort of what you're now working on? You've talked sort of at the very start about sort of looking at technology, automation and the workplace. Is this one of the applications that, that you're looking at in this new role? Yeah, very much so. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's again, very, very early stages. And, and I think we're kind of getting on this research path. But for me, it's, it's um, we, we started really thinking around the idea of how do we quantify human resources and their relationship specifically to technology? So what are the kinds of jobs uh, 
What are the kinds of tasks that those jobs do? What are the kinds of technologies that impact those tasks? And therefore, what is the value add as we transition into, admittedly, another fourth industrial revolution, future of work idea, which basically means that we can have a lot more technology, a lot more automation, and a lot more ability to augment or even replace human labor. And uh, clearly, if we think about hu replacing human labor, we are, we are concerned. So we're thinking about collectively, I think we're thinking about what does this mean for unemployment? What does this mean for our structure of society? What does it mean for inequality? And so there's a fair amount of sort of thinking around this topic. And I think the governments around the world, from Australia to Europe, somewhat to the US, are thinking along the lines of how do we um, make sure that this transition is even, it's fair, people are prepared for it, there's retraining, it happens in a gradual, predictable way, doesn't dislocate people, et cetera. I think on the other hand, there's obviously enormous opportunity. And I think that opportunity has really come so far into portfolios through the idea of technology plays. So, I mean, you know, a lot of companies have released uh, technology automation robots type funds, which tend to buy, I don't know, between 30 and 40 technology companies around the world and, and basically bet on the fact that technology will ultimately be the winner out of this whole thing. I, th I think the picture is a lot more complex than that. And, and I guess the work that um, we're doing right now in Fathom is generally trying to explore very early stages still. Um, how do we quantify this for a whole range of different industries and countries? And therefore, how do we build a much more complete picture of what happens as this wave of automation sweeps across this range of industries, countries, geographies? What will happen to the sovereign risk? What will happen to uh, infrastructure? What will happen to um, companies, so listed companies, their valuation, what are the structure of industries and so on? And then really trying to create a much more diversified, quantified um, investment viewpoint, I suppose, across this range so that an asset owner or somebody with a large range of companies can can evaluate how that company will kind of do well in that. And I think maybe just a quick final thought on that is if you think about ESG, you think about carbon investing, you think about um, environmental change, climate change, very much that, that's been a, a kind of the, the first point to develop here where asset owners have had to look across their uh, asset classes, their portfolios and get a sense of where they're investing the money whether they are kind of carbon friendly, whether they're not, or, or at least what will happen to their portfolio of assets as the environment changes, and therefore what will be the impact in multitude of different ways that the environment impacts uh, corporate or commercial or societal values. And I tend to think about AI and automation in a very similar kind of way, except it's a man-made phenomenon in this case. It's interesting, and this this will be my last question, and it comes back to um, sort of this AI that, that this AI world that's coming out there. I think some of the times people start to think about this as some sort of dystopian world, um, and that the the machines are taking over, you know, and, and are we going to start to lose our human values, and and where does ethics play in this role where you know you've got machines making decisions? What what, what are your thoughts there? Well, it, it's a fascinating problem. So I think it's um, often when we think about automation and AI, we think about a human god or demigod. Like we, we kind of imbue a human being with incredible powers. And then we wonder why all these become bad guys who want to kill everybody and uh, dominate the world and so on. I, I think it's a very different kind of problem here. So first, first of all, I think the pandemic has really changed the, the face and complexion of, of technology and automation. And this is a piece that uh, we wrote with Fathom uh, with um, MIT Technology Review and another one with KPMG around the idea that um, in the future of automation is much more uh, as likely to be about risk management and creating resilient workforces than it is about just automating for capitalist and commercial purposes. In other words, if the next pandemic has a 30% mortality rate and is airborne, wouldn't it be great if we had you know, self-driving cars delivering your pizza, or et cetera, et cetera. So the amount of, um, I suppose, protection that we can build around our systems and infrastructure using automation to protect us from these type of, um, you know, kind of either viral or, or other kinds of effects is substantial. So why don't we? And so I think that type of question I see us taking forward, you know, how every crisis creates its, its, its own babies, its own narratives. Uh, for 2008, we had a lot of the, the financial regulation that came off the back of it. I can see a lot of uh, regulation infrastructure coming off the back of making sure that um, you know supermarkets and food retailers and doctors and hospitals are as much automated as possible and have all these buffers and technology in place. So I can kind of see that coming as a necessary force. So I think the conversation of whether it's quote unquote evil or not will kind of become mute because you'll see 
a lot of these things coming through because of that reason. And I think the second point is, is important to understand, which is that dystopian future is a fascinating one because again, we kind of roll it forward in a very linear way. Uh, for me, a dystopian future is really where um, we have the future of um, coming through in a way that creates inequality and creates society. So it's not the fact that you got Terminators running around with guns or, or subjugating human beings. It's the fact that people are subjugating other people and technology is creating a buffer or enabling um, some of that to happen as opposed to what we want it to do, which is to enable people as opposed to to be equal and to be much more uh, able to self-realize and therefore put in effort and, and get outcomes and so on. And there's a whole other conversation that we, we're not going to have today about um, universal basic income and, and the, the kind of role that it plays in this whole story. But for me, a dystopian future is very much one where people are not, not enabled and not heard uh, for, for, for what they are able to do versus one where, where the robots versus humans kind of story. Well, that's been a fascinating conversation. Look, it's it, it's not going to stop today with with respect to AI and people's comfort of, of data, and you know people have been willing to give a lot of data. It's it's also caused a lot of angst for some people. Even with the COVID app, there there was a lot of angst about whether they should download or not download this app. So it's it's not a question that we're going to be able to solve today. But thank you very much for your time today, Michael. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.